Welcome to B2B Impact by BDB. Join me, Matt Smith, CEO of BDB, and Oliver Brewood, BDB's Head of Digital and Technology, as we get together to discuss the myriad of trends, topics, opportunities, and developments in the world of B2B marketing and communications. Our aim is to arm you with content, opinions, and insights that deliver lasting and meaningful impact across the B2B community, helping the global businesses and brands we partner with navigate their way through the information and communication revolution. Are you ready to make an impact? Hi everybody and welcome back to the B2B Impact and in this week you've got Ollie and myself chatting through some of the articles and topics that have caught our eye uh, during the last week since our last episode. So Ollie, do you want to kick us off? What's uh, what's uh, on your radar this week? So I think one of the topics I suppose that I've been looking at and, and thinking about, especially because it's uh, off of some of the uh, kind of internal training sessions and things like that we've been discussing, um, it's kind of more about brand awareness because okay. I know for, for clients we often run kind of brand awareness activity. Um, but I, I guess one of the thoughts I have is how focused is it on on actually trying to achieve an objective? Because I think one of the, the stats that I saw this week that I thought was really interesting and probably goes without saying if we, if we think about it, is that only 5% of B2B buyers are actually kind of in market and ready to buy at any one time. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the purpose of brand awareness, obviously depending on your objectives, but a lot of it is, is gonna be around kind of staying front of mind with buyers yeah. because you know if I'm not ready to buy in January, maybe a contract I have is up in, in December. So let's make sure that come December, I'm thinking of your company. Mm -hmm. And I guess my kind of initial thought there was, I'm not sure how much focus people are really putting on specifically staying front of mind. Mm -hmm. Cause I know we do things that are, might be brand awareness. So we might put videos out there um, on, on LinkedIn, for example, that'll go to, to audiences. But then, you know, how much like email nurture is happening in the meantime? Because I think that's one of the ones that I think I see not being utilized enough specifically is kind of email nurture. Is that in terms of personalized campaigns or to pull people through the funnel? Because I think I think in, in B2B historically, a lot of the sales collateral and content that was being produced, as you say, was focused more towards the 5% of people that are in market and ready to buy. And one of the things we you know, we, we uh, discuss with clients and, and consult with clients on, I guess, is trying to map even the overall content against the buyer's journey mm -hmm. to match where they are in that process and what kind of information they're seeking to yeah. find within there, I guess. Yeah, I think I think that is the case at the moment is that I, I've seen like recently nurture journeys being focused around, like you say, pulling people through the funnel, which might be a, a three month window. So you, anybody that's in market in that period, you might mm -hmm. well be catching. But thinking, I suppose, beyond that and thinking of if that isn't that person's three month window, mm -hmm. how do we make sure that you are top of mind when it comes to them buying, you know, later on, trying yeah. to make sure you've got either some ongoing journeys or or triggers kind of that, that can occur throughout that would put them in one of those funnel journeys. And keep moving them through, yeah. I guess, being the critical point as well. Like, and I guess a lot of this stems from in terms of the brand, uh, the brand value and the purpose of brand is probably linked to the fact there's very little, I don't want to say very little product differentiation. I appreciate in certain markets and certain sectors, there clearly is product differentiation, but generally speaking, I guess, um, across both B2C and B2B to an extent, there's less and less yeah. um, product differentiation leading to what I think in the, the article that you shared with us, it talks about like the, the brand moat, which is quite, I thought that was quite an interesting term in terms of the, the, I guess, the perimeter you can build around your brand that really enables you to elevate your brand beyond uh, beyond the others that are available in the marketplace. And a lot of that links back to, I guess, the value proposition alongside the mission, the vision, the values, which speaking candidly, I think earlier on in my career, I sort of took slightly for granted, but mm. I think as the generational movements are changing now and you've got more awoke, aware, younger demographic, I actually think the mission, the vision, the values and kind of the complementary aspects of the brand and the causes and the purpose is actually becoming more important. Do you, do you agree or? Yeah, I think otherwise you risk being a commodity if it just says our product is amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, everybody says their product's amazing. Yeah. And I think brand is one of those major differentiators where if you see what they're saying, you resonate with that messaging and, mm -hmm. and you you know, you look at what what's going out there and you're going, that's right, I agree with that. Yeah. Then, you you know, it's, it's just more likely that you'll end up you know, going and, and remembering that brand and going back to them later on in the process. Yeah, yeah. And I think particularly if you're also looking to, I guess when we talk about brand generally, there's multifaceted arguments to it, but I guess 
the employer brand side of things, which also links into it as well, particularly in a market at the minute where there's such talent scarcity. Mm. And I think that goes across both global and, and sector. Um, differentiating yourself as an employer as well is equally important. And again, I think that's where the kind of purpose, mission, vision, values really comes into play. And even for ourselves, we've, we've been working on it hard here at BDB to, to make it clear and uh, understandable to our team who we are, what we're about, why you'd want to work with us and so on, beyond what it be to be a marketing agency, as you say, which is kind of the- uh, Yeah, it's just kind of a given. Of <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But I think I think the employer brand is equally important because without your team, particularly if you're in a service-based business these days, you're going to be struggling. Yeah. Um, and you're seeing a lot more, even at interviews where uh, the, the people will be more picky about who they're joining. Um, and I think because of the market and where it's at with supply and demand with talent at the minute, there's, um, people be more selective about who they want to join. So I think th thinking about and putting more time into your value proposition, particularly if it's something that you've not revisited for a while, I think you tend to see it in cycles, don't you? So people tend to pick up on it once yeah. every three, five years or something. But I think it, to be top of mind, both from a business perspective and an employment perspective at the minute is equally critical. Yeah. I guess one of the hard parts we, we were touching on before is, is then how do you, if you're going to invest this kind of money in, in your brand, how do you kind of show results for it? Mm -hmm. Which is obviously, I think if you compare it to like lead generation, it's, it's much muddier waters, isn't it? Because obviously it's not as not as straightforward as knowing for a fact that these 10 companies are now aware of us, but they weren't before. Whereas with lead generation, you can kind of know that. Yeah. So um, I suppose that's just, it's going to be different in every case, but I think that's something that you can kind of challenge yourself on and, and, and push yourself to say, well, there are ways to, to kind of measure brand awareness, brand equity, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So how do we do it? And some examples off the top of my head are things like looking at the traffic to your website, I guess there's both in terms of like direct traffic or in terms of kind of like branded search that's showing that people are, are looking for you specifically mm -hmm. uh, instead of coming off the back of a campaign you've done. I guess are things like looking at social engagement, but then there's also the kind of the more business metric side of things like looking has your transaction value changed? Or if we think about that example before about the kind of a nurture funnel and somebody being out of market, mm -hmm. are you starting to see more people coming to you that had previously engaged with you, yep. um, but like coming back to you six months later? If you measure the difference between kind of your status quo and, and where that sits after any changes you've made, yep. then that gives you a bit of a steer as to, to how your efforts are working. I think the difficulty is that it's so early on in the process. So in the sense of it's so early on in the funnel, isn't it? This kind of stuff for the brand awareness side of things. When it comes to the measurement side of it for C-suite or, or, or budget providers, when you're looking for that bang for buck return on investment, there's no tangible evidence behind it. So I say, if you say more people have come to the website, the average order values increase. The number of businesses, I think that could pluck those numbers out of the air regardless of size, I think it's quite interesting that we work with is increasingly challenging and also requires that level of dedication and time yeah. and ability to be able to pull that, pull that information out. Um, but the, 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 the clients and businesses we work with that are doing best are, are yeah. using those kind of metrics. And I just don't think it's, it's one of the ones where I think it's very easy to be like, oh, we can't do that. But I think if you really challenge yourself to do it, there will be a way you can start trying to put measures in place and it doesn't matter. I know one of the examples I always have in my head is when you start talking about like average order values. Yep. I've heard a few times people going like, oh, we can't we can't work that out. It's too complicated. It depends which product yeah, you, you buy. You absolutely can. It's like, from that's why it's an average. <laughs> yeah, no, no, yeah. but it's not an exact <laughs> science. I think you, I think with a lot of this stuff, you've got to have a starting point. Yeah. So I think sometimes it's forming that benchmark and deciding, you know, if, if, if you're within, if you're within not only size of business, obviously, but if you're a larger business, like some of the businesses we work with, if you're within a hundred thousand, maybe a million potentially for some clients you're talking about of an average order value, that might be a good, good enough yeah. starting point for something you can move. And even like setting top. a benchmark and realizing that you're way off mm -hmm. is better than not having a benchmark at all, because that's at your start of your measurement process and understanding how you can how you can improve and get more accurate. And then there's also the more qualitative. Uh, it's the phrase that you hear, you hear used quite a lot around this area, but measures that you could put in place as well. Things yeah. like and. Again, we don't see too many too many companies and B two B companies that we work with doing this, but things like MPS scores, yeah. customer surveys, brand recall, brand recall, to make sure. yeah. In terms of um, you know how top of mind the brand is, I guess, and that gives you that more kind of anecdotal, um, I guess, from the coal face with with customers or stakeholders. You know how top of mind are you? 
but you need you need again to have that measure in place. Yeah. So I often think in year one, when you sort of talk about introducing something like MPS, there's kind of a reticence towards it by a lot of people because you're like, well, it's not going to tell us anything in year one, but you've got to look longer term. This is a two or three year process where you're going to see the gradual improvements across it, I guess. Yeah, but I know MPS scores, for example, I know a company that started doing that recently and, mm -hmm. and obviously there's not much you can do with it right away in terms of the actual score. But mm -hmm. what you can do is where somebody's got like a terrible score right away, mm -hmm. like the individual cases, that's like a real customer service opportunity to go like, oh, well, this person's unhappy. Let's speak to them, find out why they're unhappy and either look to make them happy or look to improve uh, the process or whatever it might be in the future so that, that it's less likely to happen again. Because even though you don't have a benchmark for the score, it's already setting you up for improvement the next time you measure it. Yeah, no, absolutely. So moving on from that, I guess one of the other topics we, we came across this week, one of the other articles of interest was linked to uh, trade shows and exhibitions and I guess the ever evolving landscape we find ourselves in at the minute. Um, and linked to the last point, I think a lot of uh, B2B marketing activity and budget goes towards trade shows, which a lot of that can be brand awareness and being top of mind mm -hmm. and being, being um, I guess, in the face of the stakeholders and potential customers you want to work with. But it was a, an article from Marketo um that was that was shared which was interesting because it, it, it's it's talking about three captains of industry that they um surveyed in previous years to ask me why do you go to trade shows when um a significant portion of your marketing and communications budget goes towards it and i think the three reasons that were given was because our competitors are there um it's mostly about the image you've got to be seen um, and then one guy particularly said they're a self-perpetuating problem. Yeah. We've always gone, so we will always go. Yeah, and then to the extent if you took the money that you put into trade shows and invested that into other activities to drive contribution, margin, and so on, um, what a better position they'd be in as a business. But there is this fear factor of not being there. Yeah. Well, yeah, I suppose initially, what are your thoughts on trade shows? Because I've not been to a lot of like the B2B type trade shows. So yep. I suppose my experience with trade shows is more... I suppose when we're talking about like tech, so I've been to some shows where, you know, I walk around and, and look at the different solutions. And, and then I suppose it's somewhat helpful in, in that nearly every solution there is potentially applicable to us or a client. So yeah. you get to know what's in the market, but um, obviously it could be done online or I could have just spent that same time researching. It would have been a lot more cost effective. I think the whole landscape's changed dramatically. I think going back a few years, only a few years, my misconception with trade shows was a lot that it was more towards new business generation in B2B. Um, and then once you deep dive into it more and you get more involved with it, you realize there's, there's multi-levels to why people go to the trade shows. And it's not always about new business generation. It's quite often about meeting people, whether that's meeting stakeholders, signing contracts, signing in B2B particularly, signing business, meeting your clients face-to-face, -face, shaking hand, looking people in the eye, telling them you're gonna deliver for them. Um, and then obviously coupled with that, the social aspects of it. Mm. So in terms of networking with your with your stakeholders and taking them for dinner and the classic kind of um, schmoozing scene, I guess, in the evenings. But I think all of that in principle sounds good. We know social connections are important and will help business. We know that building a customer relationship is good. Obviously, we want to sign more business up, but it involves an awful lot of travel. Huge. It's not particularly sustainable, particularly when you get into you know some of the larger exhibitions where companies are spending a hundred to three hundred grand just on the stand build alone, and then the same again on like accommodation and things like that. What what I'd, what I'd say is it's linked to people having lazy objectives set around exhibitions. So if you go back to the quotes at the beginning, people go because they have to go. So because they have to go, they don't necessarily set very stringent KPIs around that attendance because it's just a sunk cost of the business in a way that they just think we've got to spend it anyway. So we're going to have to be there. Whereas linked to the sustainability point, the travel cost point and the, and the kind of overhead impacts of it, this is where the, the landscape's completely changing at the minute post pandemic. So I think there's been an awakening of most businesses, exhibition organizers and the public to do I need to travel? Um, should I be traveling from a sustainability perspective? Um, and you're also seeing a massive, de the, the events we've been to recently have attended it with clients, a huge reduction in footfall. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the global audiences that these exhibitions used to attract, they're way down on what they used to be yeah. at the minute because um, of people's restrictions on travel, the ongoing uh, pandemic across various territories. But then also I think people have become more aware of, do I need to travel to see this? Is it worth my while going here? Yeah. So what I have heard anecdotally from clients is there's less people at the trade shows, but the quality has improved because mm. the people that are going are 
genuinely people that are interested in doing business or making business as opposed to people that just walk in the floor. That kind of connects to a thought I had around virtual events, which mm-hmm. I know we'll get onto, but they're obviously the kind of immediate reaction to yeah. to trade shows not being able to run in the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. And I know um, Adobe, I think in, in that Marketo example, we're talking about how they managed to pivot Adobe Summit from being an in-person event to yeah. a virtual event in 30 days. So that was at the very start of the pandemic in 2020, which is- Sounds ambitious, doesn't it? Obviously they've got the money and, and the tech know-how to really put it off. Um, but I think that's uh, one of the things I was thinking, I suppose, was around attention span when it comes to virtual events. Yeah. And I suppose I was thinking, is it as good? I mean, I'm more likely to switch off partway through. Mm-hmm. But then maybe that's just a form of self-qualification, a bit like you were saying then with regards to trade shows, is that the, the quality is improving. And that's because the people that were just like, I'll have a day out of the office or I just want to go browse aren't going. The people with real intent are going. And maybe the same applies to a virtual event that, yes, some people will switch off partway through, but they were never going to buy anyway. I also think the people that control the P&Ls, like in terms of the, the, the travel and the marketing spend and the, and the, and the, the people that were plowing money into this have also realized, hang on, business kept going during the pandemic and people weren't traveling the globe and nothing... I appreciate some businesses were massively impacted, by the way, but a lot of the B2B side of things that we work in, I guess, were, were relatively yeah. unaffected and the wheels kept turning. So is there a need to fly out? I mean, we've seen less, we've seen clients more face-to-face, albeit digitally, than we ever have in, in face-to-face meetings, despite yeah. most of our clients being overseas. And it's a strange setup, and I'm very keen to get back in front of clients on a personal perspective. But I, I think they've got to be much more purposeful, impactful meetings than we'll just come and see you kind yeah. of thing, which I think is what you're seeing in the trade shows. And I think linked to the point of the pivot into the virtual event side of things that we've seen, I guess, and I, it's my, my personal bugbear, I'll take you to the grave with me, but in terms of the webinars. So I think in B2B, if you've not done a webinar recently, where, where have you been? Most Everybody seems to have done one. <laughs> but I think in terms of, this comes back to your point around, um, it was one of, one of the quotes in one of the articles was around give people a reason to attend live rather than watching it after the event. Mm. And I think you're seeing people being particularly lazy with the quality of the content yeah. that they're actually producing, which is now leading to just like we've seen the term Zoom fatigue and Teams fatigue, webinar fatigue is a genuine thing that if you're going to send another invite, so let's say it's the 10th webinar invite you've had in a month. Mm-hmm. And for some of these stakeholders and people you're trying to influence, that's the reality of the situation you're going to be in. What what is their reason to attend yours over one of the others? Or if they've already been to three that month, why would they want to go to a fourth? Yeah. So unless you're offering something that's really unique or quality content or really insightful or bringing maybe a, a thought leader into play or something that's really going to give them a reason to attend, mm-hmm. I'm not surprised we're seeing some clients and prospects complaining that they've got really low uptake on webinars. Are yeah. you? <laughs> no, and it, and it refers back to, um, so there's a article on the National Institute of Health, the US uh, government website. And it's, it's basically a, a journal article specifically about webinar fatigue. Mm-hmm. And unsurprisingly, I suppose, they're emphasizing as a conclusion that it's quality rather than frequency. Yeah. That doesn't mean that it can't be frequent, but if it's gonna be frequent, it need, you need to be thinking about why you have having a lot of webinars, who are they for different audiences? And that could well be the case that one's for uh, somebody at this stage of the buying process, one's for a customer that's got this type of problem and so on, in which case it might make a lot of sense to have frequent webinars, but they need to be of sufficient quality that it's it's worth you know hosting them. This isn't just a, oh, we'll get some leads and we don't really but care. I also intent. think linked into that, and I can spend all day talking about webinars too, but I mean it more in the sense of, as well as the quality, it's almost, flipping the lens more because I think a lot of the webinars we're seeing at the minute are focused on <laughs> here's what we do here's what we've got to sell come to our webinar and we'll tell you about it for an hour yeah and rather than what's the problem you're facing you know like as in making it more relevant to the actual attendee um and showing more empathy towards the situation they find themselves in yeah. but several of the webinars I've attended or sat in or dropped into recently have been so as you say that, linking right back to the first point, so that 5% you're in market to buy focus when they're not actually, most people are looking for to educate yeah. themselves. And I think it's more. often, they're often in, in terms of format, they're often quite dry as well. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna run you through a slide deck that's about our products and, and the challenges that our products address. And it's one person talking for 45 minutes, sometimes at an hour, a full hour. Would you would you do an in-person meeting where for an hour I go through a PowerPoint with you turning page after page after page 
the page with one voice coming at you with very limited audience interaction. But if you are doing that, I'd advise you to stop doing it. Probably that's why you're not, not making the, the numbers yeah. and the sales that you need to. It's the exact same principle. You need to think about how to get people engaged, don't you? So yeah. if you are going to host webinars and make sure that you've got a, a purpose uh, behind it that people are going to really engage with, thinking about how do you encourage audience participation? Mm-hmm. Is that is that polls? Is that asking the questions in chat? Is that taking Q and A either during or at the end of the webinar? And then to be to be honest, I've never looked it up, but I know one of the stats that I've heard quoted to me in the past is that if after fifteen minutes of one person talking, people tend to start switching off. Yeah, and whether that's actually a proven fact or not, there's definitely logic behind it. Okay. So should you be thinking about having a couple of people yep. um, speaking instead and taking it in turns and possibly asking each other questions to make it more conversational kind of throughout? Yep. Um, I, I think there's a lot of things people could do to encourage participation. There's there's simple apps out there, like we used one recently, didn't we, which I think was Mentimeter. Yeah, yeah, that was encouraging yeah, yeah, used it, yeah. audiences to submit responses during a webinar, either in polls or just as in like literally um, put in a couple of words and it'll throw up a word cloud on the screen, but it's I think that's like a really, live. A really interesting way as well, just using that as an example to offer a hybrid experience. So when we were using it personally, we had a live audience and um, a remote audience. And I think combining aspects of it like that, where actually you're bringing their results together yeah. despite not being sat together, it's a really simple and effective way of offering that kind of hybrid experience as well. I think the one caveat I'd quickly add there, because you and I both sat in a um, a lecture hall once listening to a presentation. And I think one of the key things, if you're going to do something like that, change the presentation based on the result. Obviously, you can't go and edit your slides straight away. I realize that. But at least call back to the result, because I think we saw it done once, where (laughs) there was a big poll, the audience gave the responses, and then the speaker just sort of went, okay, moving on. And it's just like, no, now you've got, a key data point for the 100 people in the room, or obviously as we're talking about now online, as to what they're interested in. So that should be your callback constantly throughout the rest of the presentation. I think a lot of that comes back to the ability of the presenter though, doesn't it? Because if you've, if you've learned your scripts and you've not learned your slides really well and the result doesn't go the way you anticipated on the slide, it could really throw you off. So I think it's being able to flex. And I think, but I'd say be totally mindful of that. I think it's a really good point. Um, but you do see more and more of that. I guess in terms of other other tips for virtual events, you know, to make yourself stand out against the webinar, there's various articles out there online. I think one of the ones we were looking at the other day. But I think it's an interesting point, even the ba- the basics of, of putting on a virtual event, because I think there's a lot of oversights that are in there, from the internet connection to the quality of the video equipment. I also do think you need a tech savvy teammate. It says in here, but I do I I would yeah. definitely agree with that. And I can talk to a few of the challenges we've had there in the last year briefly, which yeah. is like just in terms of the productions, like. I've seen a few cases where somebody's gone, my internet connection's always fine. This tool says that I'm failing their speed test, but it's always been fine. And then they try and do a live webinar and lo and behold, it doesn't work very well because their internet connection's just not fast enough to run it. Yeah. And then uh, we've seen a lot of cases where we've had, because of the nature of our audience, we've had um, scientists, university yeah. professors and so yeah. on, who are obviously incredibly knowledgeable and experts in their field, but not necessarily very tech savvy. So from that point of view, it it does really help if you've got somebody in your team, whether that's somebody in IT or somebody in marketing, whoever it might be, just helping to be that um, troubleshooter when when there are inevitably problems because there there always will be in IT. I think if you get 10 speakers lined up for an event, for example, you're guaranteed one or two of them will have problems. I guess that's the downside of inviting the industry speakers. So the the industry leaders you've got there and the thought leaders in the room with you to to attract the audience, as you say, typically, aren't the most tech savvy of individuals. So yeah, you do see uh, uh, various problems with earphones. Yeah. Just anecdotally is one of the ones that I, yeah. want, that I saw a lot of. Yeah. Well, I think that's, that's another point is connected to that is make sure you've got the right equipment. Yeah. So if, if that's a case of spending, you know, 40 euros on a pair of headphones with a mic for, yeah. for a speaker, that'd yeah. be worthwhile if, if it's gonna be done remotely. I mean, conversely, having uh, kind of counter that to that rather, Having industry leaders is another key way to to kind of elevate the quality of your your um, webinars. Just make, make sure you're doing a dress rehearsal. I yes, it's probably the, it's dress the, rehearsal and don't just and take the word for it. <laughs> respond to it if there are IT issues. Yeah, if you're having major issues, get them a laptop or get them to a uh, something like a WeWork or something if you have to or bring them to the office yeah, yeah. if that's practical. 
I think even, even, the, even these days, you know, hiring some space in a podcast studio, you can do it relatively in, inexpensively. Certainly here in Manchester, that's, that kind of stuff's available for kind of like, yeah. you know, a matter of 60, 50, 60 pounds an hour. So to put them in a studio where it's soundproofed and you haven't got a car alarm going off in the background like we have at the minute, if <laughs> anybody can hear that, apologies. Um, but that kind of stuff does, you know, it does matter, particularly if it's a live event and you want it to be yeah. really polished and, and, and fine for the audiences you're, you're looking after. I guess one of the other points in, in the announcement and the top tips for your virtual event or your presence was around making it fun for the attendees. So we touched on engagement earlier and polls and making them feel like they're involved in the process. But I think it's an interesting point linking back to physical exhibitions. I'm not saying this is the sole, sole reason why people used to go, but a lot of people used to go for freebies. Yeah. So they'd, they'd go to get the samples. They wanted the pens, they wanted the bags, they wanted the t-shirts. And these, yeah. are, these are lower quality leads, don't get me wrong, but you know, yeah. Offering something sometimes does help drag people and a bit of footfall yeah. towards an event. Yeah, and I, yeah, I don't think there's a reason. I don't think you see it a lot in B two B outside no. of exhibitions. But there's there's nothing wrong with like giving away freebie. Yeah, um, make it. It doesn't have to be to everybody. Just make it enticing or have a competition or you know say anybody that participates in the poll will be entered into a draw, whatever it might be, or yeah. host some kind of game. I know one of the ones I went to um, was a. I think it was the last event I went to before COVID actually. Um, basically, the glory had, is. <laughs> yeah. basically had a, I think it was a, a couple of quiz questions up front that were, that were topical. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just uh, random, but the winner got uh, one of the authors, like signed copy of an author's book okay. or, or something like that. So it, it still a B2B focused event, but it got everybody, it got everybody having a bit of fun at the very beginning, got everybody engaged. And then when you, when you actually start the, the subject matter, you, you're doing it with a smile on your face. Yeah. We've also seen it done quite well across some uh, clients and prospects in terms of samples and prototypes and that kind of thing. And I appreciate, you know, you can't send a thousand prototypes out into your audience and make it cost effective. And you've also got to be sustainable and thinking about your, your, your overall cost of this kind of thing. But I think don't assume that, uh, I don't know, even if it's food and it's, t it's a tasting profile, you've seen people do it well with um, on B2C side of things with cocktails and gin tasting and all that kind of stuff that we've touched on previously. But I think depending on what your sample is, to get, you can still get it in, in your attendee's hand and still unite an audience by the moment you pick it up, the moment you taste it, the moment you, um, whatever whatever it may be, I guess. Yeah. But, um, Try sample A now. <laughs> yeah, I just think that's, that's one of the things that, it's quite a lot of barriers to the virtual events and the B2B side of things that people go to trade shows to engage with those samples. And I think if you're approaching it more on a VIP basis, that if you could bring in 50 or 100 top quality leads and have those people on a focused conversation, more like a, I guess, a, a large scale round table potentially. Um, again, just don't, don't, don't dismiss it. Think outside, outside of the box. In you terms can of dial you down do those it. numbers, having 20 high value leads on a call with a sample box surely everybody would want that. Depends, that's depends, on the, depends on the average order value, doesn't yeah. it? But <laughs> I guess it comes down to what's practical. But if you're if you're looking at this and thinking sending out a box of 100 things is too much, mm -hmm. then, you know, I think you'd find a lot of value in, in the smaller figures still. And I think the final tip in terms of virtual events would be don't, don't be afraid to ask for feedback. I think quite often in B2B, we're a bit nervous to ask for feedback of anecdotal conversations around it, but you know, this is a new world for most people. People are quite often doing their first or early days in their events. So ask your stakeholders, ask the attendees, was it good? Was it bad? What did we do right? What did we do wrong? How would you like to hear more of? Yeah. Is this a top, is this what we you thought you were going to hear when yeah. you're based on the, on the subject? Because all that will help inform your next event and make sure that that's... Well, I think it gives you an angle for the next event. You yeah. know, we ask you the questions, we listened, it's better. So in terms of not just another one, it's better than last time because yeah. we've listened to what you, what you asked for. So. And even if you've got anecdotal feedback uh, from people that have dropped messages throughout the chat or whatever where they were like oh this is great and it, and your attendance is amazing still ask for feedback mm -hmm. doesn't mean it can't be better um and i think uh, yeah I, I agree i think it's something we very rarely see being done in in the b2b space at least yeah no 100 percent. okay conscious of the time we've somehow made it to 28 minutes um so conscious of the 30 minute cutoff we've set ourselves so we don't end up rambling for too long um, hopefully people found that insightful and interesting. We'll be covering off more topics next week. If there's any topics you want us to take a deeper dive into, I'm conscious in these kind of sessions, we're skimming through some, some areas and just trying to um, set the path for you that areas you can explore and things to be mindful of. Um, each one of the topics we've, we've, we've come across today, we could spend probably hours discussing in reality. Um, but yeah, hopefully, hopefully you've enjoyed the session with us. Um, thanks for joining us and I'll see you next week on the B2B Impact. Thanks.